please start the session sir good morning to all wish you a happy sunday this is chandra mohan ortho physiotherapist from sri samraj physiotherapy center dindivanam tamil nadu a warm welcome to all for the exrx indias and sri samraj health services private limited presenting webeta a web series interesting for the world record in the field of physiotherapy not just counting on the topics but we responsibly providing the knowledge for the physiotherapist in india and more than 20 countries apart from this exrx india is providing online og consultation for the women's health related issues in association with pickle studio chennai dusa creations west bengal powered by fitness and rehab india youtube channel exrx india's 229th topic is role of physiotherapy and nutrition in cerebral palsy and autism will be presented by dr vijay lakshmi giri fitness first physiotherapy and rehabilitation clinic ceo lalit academy and research center certified nutrition advisor consultant physiotherapist in jetty college of homeopathy gutal college of ayurveda and manohka center hubli i welcome exrx india team members dr rupesh and professor duna and her team members ms simran and ms uma and now i welcome our resource person dr vijay lakshmi giri and i request her to come and the session please madam good morning everyone good morning madam yes so should i shall i share screen first yes madam duna madam please help her so good morning everyone before starting this session i would like to give i mean a thank uh, chandramohan sir duna ma'am rupesh sir that is a whole team of exrx for giving me this platform to present this special uh, subject today for today and uh, being sunday uh, early morning 11:30 probably uh, i wish everyone is fresh no to uh, go ahead with this session so today's topic being role of uh, physiotherapy and nutrition uh, especially and a special children and today i'm uh, covering cp and autism so basically it will be early detection and early intervention here when we talk about cere cerebral palsy as a physiotherapist we have to know everything you know basically starts from the causes um uh, different types of causes at different levels right from uh, before birth during birth after birth may be acquired at times so this is a huge topic but uh, today i have uh, condensed it as uh, much as possible and um, i'm trying to brief it out for you all so first to go ahead 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 with the statistics which we'll be seeing okay a small uh, picture here india has more than 25 lakhs of cerebral palsy cases when we go with a thousand life birth it goes to 2.2 to 2.5 lakhs worldwide it is 2.2 to 2.8 per thousand life birth 
Now, another very important lifespan which I'm putting here is 30 to 70 years, the CP kids have the lifespan, depending upon the severity of the condition. Okay, so basically one in four children with cerebral palsy cannot feed or dress themselves. This is just the statistics that I'm presenting. 70% of clinical trials show stem cells and um, could improve cognitive brain development and motor skills, right? So for example, to take a country, okay, uh, it's very nicely given over here from Australia, which says one in five children develop CP. It is a movement disorder wherein the severity is on the increase. So it is one of the most expensive disability to manage. So a child born with CP, you know, it is like every 15 hours. So you can imagine how fast it is growing. Okay. So when we come to the employment level statistics, put up on uh, the global scenario here for the people with disabilities. So 80% of people with disability live in the developing countries. So there is an 85% unemployment rate for the people with disabilities in the developing countries. That means yet people with milder disabilities can go for a full employment, but other people stay back unemployed. So with this statistics, it's very important to focus, you know, the cerebral palsy or the child with special abilities as early as possible. So to go with the subject, so what is cerebral palsy? We all know as a physios or the and a students in a physiotherapy, everyone has a view, okay, of basically this is the main pediatric section here, uh, the subject that we have. But for the general public, uh, I'll be putting it in a brief. So cerebral palsy isn't a single condition. It's a family of disorders that affects a person's ability to move caused by brain damage sustained in pregnancy, during labor or delivery, shortly after birth. And at times we have seen even after one year to two years that CP can get in. So C CP is the most common physical disability in the children. So we have the causative factors during pregnancy, like inadequate oxygen supply to the womb, inadequate fluid, aged mothership, infertility treatment, a small jerk, head shock on the fetus or the fetus skull, multiple fetus in any infections. Okay. So during birth, what we see is the inadequate oxygen supply to the baby. So as soon as the baby comes out, after the labor, if it doesn't cry, so that is where we get the inadequate oxygen supply to the baby. So maybe unsafe birth techniques, what we call as a breech positioning, the position that we have here, or uh, the suction uh, labor that we go through. Okay, so th those also can cause cerebral palsy. Low weight. So there we are, that's a main risk factor here. So any OBG problems, again, during labor, any head shock uh, or we have the cord around the neck, any infection, the uh, uh, operation theater may not be clean or anything can get this into. So basically what we see is the baby doesn't cry, you know, immediately or it may, you know, get infectious or um, the handling of the person who delivers the baby. Breach presentation, when, his, uh, when the legs come out first, when the hands come out first, okay, th those things also can affect here. So childhood up to two to three years. So it is genetic problems, problems related to during birth, disease or medical effect environment, that is the wrong medications which may be given. given. So again, any hit to the skull, so what I have noticed here is like even a small 
uh, jerk when we uh, have that cradle to the baby especially in india we have the cloth cradle uh, when they push it suddenly uh, due to some ignorance it goes hit to the wall you know it hits the brain so again it goes into the you no know, any infections or high fever which may raise to the brain or meningitis meningitis you no know? so all these can lead to cp again very 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 important for today's uh, scenario is the maternal obesity which is very much linked to cerebral palsy so very nice uh, picture here which gives you like a bmi with a bmi so everyone uh, mother who is carrying a baby or who is expecting a baby should have a bmi record has 22% increased risk okay where the bmi is 25 to 29 obesity type 1 has 28% increased risk where bmi is 30 to 34 obesity type 2 has 54% increased risk where bmi is 35 to 39 obesity type 3 202% increased risk that is bmi 40 plus so obesity or being overweight in a normal layman khate peete ghar aane ke lagte hai you know so that should not be taken so being aware of your own bmi what do you eat how you expend especially if you especially if you are expecting a baby you have to take this into consideration now just to rush through the forms and stages of cp uh, we all know there are different types of stages or severity here so i'll just rush into the different types the severity level being mild moderate severe percentile level you know progressive and non progressive most of the time it is non progressive okay so topical level which part of the body is it is affected it's monoplasia diplegia hemiplegia one side paraplegia both the legs triplegia two legs and one hand double hemiplegia where both the sides are affected and at times this this child would appear to be as a floppy child so tetraplegia quadriplegia pentaplegia so depending upon the motor function we have spastic cp non spastic cp where we have ataxic dyskinetic athetoid dystonias okay so depends on again the severity of affection when the child is in the womb so not to go too much within let me tell you the importance of early detection here okay so it is it can lead to the referral for early intervention services early intervention aims to maximize motor and cognitive outcomes and the opportunities for appropriate support to the families so it's a very important part on arcs where we come into rehabilitation we even get to see the nicu children where the pediatrician has already um, delivered the baby in obg section then pediatrician in the nicu comes and sees from his side you know view examinations there are a lot of scales to identify these in the early stages but we as a physiotherapist when we are working in an icu it becomes an important role to play in this section okay so very simple to put around early markers of cp so this is after the child comes out what we have to look for is slow head growth poor head control eye rolling you know rolling eyes poor hand regard persistent squints specifically ear lack of auditory response irritability seizures poor sucking reflex poor quality of sleep the child is very very cranky 
extremely sensitive to light, the cortical thumb beyond eight weeks, handedness before two years, paucity of limb movements, scissoring of the lower limbs, then later in life, toe walking, abnormal tone. Then when we examine persistent of primitive reflexes or failure to the to acquire positional postural reflexes, stereotype abnormal movements, lack of alertness. Okay, so there's a few pictures uh, shown here. The child will not be even able to suck, you know, feed upon the mother's breast. So this is a very, very indicative immediately the second day of the birth. Okay, floppy child, there's no tone. When the child is lifted, it's very floppy. Again, the second day of the birth. Okay, so these are very uh, prominent symptoms or the early markers of CP that we can see. So as a child, maybe in different stages, as I told, mild, severe, you know, mild, moderate or severe, we have put upon uh, the prognosis also. With early intervention, more than 80% can be fully accepted. You know, they can have an acceptable life in the society. 80% of the children. I'm repeating this. It's a maximum that we can achieve. Now, according to me that I've been working since past five years, we have achieved 100% acceptable life in the society. So if the child is, you know, early detected, okay? So this is the best part. The quality of life and the survival in CP child with ambulatory capacity, with or without walking aid, is roughly equal to normal population. That means the quality of life and survival of CP with ambulatory capability is roughly equal to normal population. So that means it comes into the mild CP section. So more than 70% of the children with mild to moderate affection have nearly normal IQ. So you can see them. When the child is into mild or moderate, Again, the IQ also can be equivalent to normal or can be more than normal people. <clears throat> so can be active, productive members of communities. Okay, they can be a part of the communities as well. So they can also have, have jobs, live independently. They can marry and have children and also retire from the jobs. So this is wonderful uh, prognosis that we can put up. Okay. So just to wrap it up, when CP is diagnosed early, test for the musculoskeletal and other comorbidities can be prompted and early intervention programs can be initiated. So from the child and the family's perspective, receiving a diagnosis of CP not only provides an answer, but also justifies appropriate funding and social support. Okay, this is a very important part here. So in total, a special care where prevention is better than cure, which always goes. As this is a disease which cannot be recovered fully, it's better to prevent it not to exist. If somehow it happens, it needs a specialized training and a core feeling to understand their inabilities and communicate with the patients properly by the caregivers, as well as the guardians and the family members, as well as the paramedical and the medical staff. So they need the special love and affection to fight back and live a quality life. So I take a very privilege to present this in front of you all because I have seen many children's life changing as well the family being called a special family and the whole family changes to have a different lifestyle along with the child in their family so we consider um, the grandmas the mother parents uh, mother and father and uh, all the uncles and aunts and uh, put the child as one among the family okay so next to Russian to autism, very beautiful slide I've put here. 
basically very few people are knowing autism but as today it is an alarming alarmingly increasing um condition um, uh, just want to put across the statistics first okay so it's about 1% of the world's population to take up the statistics india has more than 21 lakhs 60000 children worldwide it is one among 160 india has one among 100 so boys are five times more than girls okay so just to rush upon the facts about autism okay so these children have learning disabilities delayed speech development obsessive compulsive disorder they are hyperactive dyspraxia is seen attention deficit hyper active disorder adhd which we call they can be also into depression they may not be responding they would prefer to be more alone okay and they have lot of speech sleep problems epilepsy is seen and they reject cuddling okay so not all can be seen in one child every child is a new story to talk about okay so just to put across a face faces which are very famous but i have autism right so you may be very surprised to see even albert einstein okay so he was very troubled interacting you know with people around he used to be alone he used to have repetitive talks you know he had problems at school and also could not find a job so sir isaac newton is a, uh, who was very quiet and not good at small talks so such very very huge famous people who are world renowned okay were autistic so today we need to understand and realize the fact that anyone can deal with autism because there are various famous celebrities with autism too so the world autism is not a social stigma it should not be considered as a social or a religious custom implying that it should not be judged in this way basically the mothers which uh, um, have given birth to such children um they have lot of thoughts process why my child you know but it is our responsibility as we come one on one with the parents or the wards that these are not those children who are affected but you you have a very very special child and you have a very special uh, place in the society just know about it and work towards the upbringing okay so autism is not a taboo that will restrict you to one room they can do all that is normal human can do whether it's about career dream or entertainment so it is justified that autistic people can achieve a lot than normal people cannot do okay so all we need is to inspire and dedicate to get what they want hence it is a big social responsibility to respect them and provide a congenital and atmosphere for their growth okay so just uh, one example where there is a huge uh, rehabilitation section for autistic kids but a very uh, small coping strategies that we can overcome autism and anxiety which can occur together okay to help them reduce and come to normalcy so like calming strategies uh, where the child can take deep breathings exercises which can help them take deep breaths visual supports consistency give them some role playing you know 
give them single orders like first x and then y so it is very directional statements then positive reinforcements and then use specific plan play, plan and concise directions plain and concise directions pre teaching and rehearsal okay so it has to be repeated sensory breaks have to be given environmental sensory accommodations have to be provided okay where there is a big space with free visual and auditory stimuli so uh, the child may be um, just sitting alone you know that we have seen uh, being introvert so we have to get in the uh, friends to make them friends help them uh, work into the group sections one after another okay so this is very in short to tell you about but i would like very much to put forward today so what we are you know providing in the society so we are working through a trust called as lalit academy and research center where we care for the baby that was you know never been there okay for the children where it, i mean the parents that the children doesn't child doesn't exist exist so what we do here so we are a center of excellence for families in and around karnataka with children who have physical disabilities so our specialist team of physiotherapist occupational therapist speech and hearing language therapist nutritional therapist they work together under one roof to offer transdisciplinary skills so each child is benefited from the combined expertise so our family support family support to service offers a listening ear advice and support we share our knowledge and skills through collaborative working so this moves ahead so we are completing 3 years now so it moves ahead to bring upon um or highlighting such kids into the society putting them back to the normal track as normal children where they start going to the normal schools as well so we have been working over it very important to go ahead is a field of neuroscience is so very new we must be comfortable not only venturing into the unknown but also into the error so special children cp or autism is not just the unknown area but it's an error so we have to find out the error and connect, correct it okay so I'll, before going into the next slide i would just like to play a video to know exactly the brain development of the child where we are very confused we briefly tell them okay there is a brain development the first three trimester the first trimester and the third trimester it grows okay it's so a very small uh, video to play here Everything starts the day your mum's egg meets your dad's sperm. Four weeks later, your little brain begins to form. Epidemiologist David Barker says that whilst developing inside our mother, we are receiving postcards from the outside. Sorry. Everything starts the day. Everything starts the day your mum's egg meets your dad's sperm. Four weeks later, your little brain begins to form. Epidemiologist David Barker says that whilst developing inside our mother, we are receiving postcards from the outside world. These postcards tell us if this world is dangerous or safe, if food is plentiful or scarce. Knowing nothing else, we learn from those messages. Let's watch what we experience and learn inside the womb from the fetus perspective. Month 1. Only 24 hours alive, every bit of genetic information is already present in a single cell, from our hair color to our talent as a future pianist. Then we divide ourselves again and again. After around a week, we travel from the ovaries to the uterus. where we then undergo the great divide splitting into two half of which will become us while the other half forms the placenta which brings us food and oxygen and carries away waste 
By week four, we have developed into a small being that is growing at a rate of one million cells per second. Our spinal cord, heart and brain are now clearly visible, even if we are just the size of a poppy seed. Month two. At about week four to five, our heart starts to beat and we are now 10,000 times bigger than we were at conception. This is a crucial point in our neurological development as our brain grows at a rate of around 100,000 cells each minute. If our mother consumes alcohol and drugs or experiences extreme stress or trauma, our tiny brain can get damaged. This can lead to maths problems at school or even schizophrenia some 40 years later. If our mum stays healthy and can relax, our brain can develop to its full potential. We are now the size of a raspberry. Month 3 At the beginning of month 3, we start to react to stimuli. Our sense of smell is developing and exposure to toxins can make us cringe. Our brain is continuing to grow very fast. Our ears start forming and we can soon hear our mum's heartbeat and voice speak. Still small enough, we have plenty of space to move inside the belly. Our mother's womb becomes our sensory playground. We learn to move our arms, stretch our fingers, smile or suck our thumb. 75% of us are now showing a preference to use the right hand. We are now around the size of a lemon. Month 4. Our head makes up about half our total size. We learn to kick, pee and how to swallow. Our taste buds are developing. If our mother eats a wide variety of things, we learn to appreciate different tastes and become less fussy eaters later in life. If we receive inadequate or poor nutrients, we adapt our physiology to sustain our development. This process is also called fetal programming. Some researchers have found that this can result in health problems such as obesity, heart conditions and diabetes later in life. We are now around the size of a big tomato. Month 5 while earlier our mum's voice sounded muffled, now it is starting to become clear. We are also experiencing a big growth spurt and we start the development of our teeth and our first real hair, fingernails, eyebrows and eyelashes. We are becoming more active each day and enjoying flexing our tiny muscles. As we wriggle, kick and turn, our mother will start to feel us moving. If she responds, we learn that for every action, there is a reaction. We are now around the size of a dragon fruit. During this sixth month, a major mark of brain development occurs. Our brain's cerebral cortex splits into two hemispheres. But it's also an exciting month for our eyes, which open for the first time. Even though we see only blurs, we start to respond to light. Some say it's good if our mum now takes us into the sun. We are now starting to make simple facial expressions, such as forming a grin. We probably learn to communicate for the time when we are born when we want to show our feelings. We are now around the size of a small cauliflower. Month 7 we begin to develop regular intervals for sleeping and being awake. The hair on our head is now clearly visible and our milk teeth have formed under our gums. When we hear our mum speak, we may respond with an increased heartbeat and movement. Some researchers claim that we now begin to learn language from hearing the voices from outside because, once born, we seem to show a preference for our dad's and mum's native language. If we were to be born now, we would have a 90% chance of survival and arrive the size of a pineapple. Month 8. We are now behaving like a newborn. Our brain is functional and our nervous system ready. Our lungs are almost fully formed and we are practicing breathing by inhaling amniotic fluid. We now spend almost all of our time asleep, maybe dreaming about our near future. In preparation for birth, most of us will have now turned upside down. To get through that tiny hole at the end of the tunnel, our bones and skull are still extremely flexible. 
only the immune system is still in its infancy. It will take many months after birth until our internal bodyguards can fully protect our health. We are now around the size of a melon. Month 9 In the last month, we keep practicing our motor skills and kicks. When our mum laughs, eats sweets or drinks an iced tea, we might respond by bouncing up and down. If we could already understand research papers, we would now hope that our mum can bring us to the world through natural birth, which protects us through a stronger immune system for life. The puzzle of what is nurture and what is nature is now well underway and already shows a first image of our character. The most important missing piece will be added in our early childhood. At the end of the nine months, we are around the size of a jackfruit. After many hours of hard labor, we will be welcomed into this world. Some will then be instantly taken away for various checkup procedures and bathing. But if we are lucky, we will first spend some time with our mum. If placed on her belly, we will instinctively crawl to her breast and then show our sucking skills. This makes us happy, full and feel safe. The foundation for all future learning. So that was uh, such a wonderful journey, right from day one of the cell to a big blown baby, right? So what the video says in just is that the brain starts growing right away. Now the detection may happen after, you know, visually you say 45 days, but by then it's already there. So the first three months are very important, okay? So thereafter it starts growing. Then we also say that the last three months, the, the third trimester is equally important because it starts developing new uh, synapses and all. Okay, so when we get into genetics, there's a basics. You know, it's not only about CP, but all spe for special kids. Very important to know is the parent's health before they conceive or they are expecting the child. Their genetic basis itself is important. What happens once a baby is instilled in the mother's womb, the cells develop to become a body. Okay, So it's very important that the DNA, the genetic factor has to be really strong. And you can see them. And the further, I'll be telling you all about it in detail. Very nice picture of the baby here, which depicts when the brain starts growing, how it grows. Basically, that is the three weeks. We have seen it is a very small pile. Four weeks, it starts to. Where the hind brain, the mid brain, and the spinal cord is formed. Okay, so three months, the four brain is seen. Six months, the brain is bigger. By nine months, it's a full boy, baby, the brain, full brain. Okay, so. To put in a big picture, you can see that at the 25th day, 35th day, 40th day, where hind brain, mid brain, and forebrain are seen, 50th day, 100 days, 5 months, 6 months, and 7 months. Okay. So why I am showing this is, the next slide which is coming up is very important for us to know that before age of five, 90% of the child's brain development happens. So that's the reason I'm telling. When the child is taken up, detected right then and then, we have a lot of space to work over as a physiotherapist. 
Okay. So only 10% of the brain develops after five years. So let's see the circumference accordingly. You know? So by nine months, it is 35 centimeters circumference. Five years, it is 50 centimeters circumference. Okay. By 21 years, it is 55 centimeters circumference. The head circumference ratio is here. So important to know here, see, five years to 21 years, there's only five centimeters difference. Okay. So the brain is already developed 90% for this. So another small video to cover up this brain fat. But what is important as a parent to know? What are my hopes for her future? I think what's most important to me is that she's healthy and happy. I want them to be responsible and respectful and successful. Curious about the world, someone who loves learning to give back to her community. I want my child to have the opportunity to follow his dream, whatever that is. I am really very open about what they want to be in the future. I want them to be whatever they want to be. Every child deserves the chance to reach their full potential. And as science continues to advance our understanding of child development and of the human brain, we know that the seeds of a healthy, successful life are planted in the early years. From day one, babies are born learning. Their brains are growing and developing at an amazing rate. In the first five years, faster than any other time in life. And how a child's brain develops in these early years will have a huge and lasting impact on their future. At birth, a baby brain is only a quarter of the size of an adult brain, but will double in size during the first year. By age three, it will grow to almost 80% of adult size and 90% by the time a child starts kindergarten. And while the brain is growing in size, it's also forming billions of connections. These connections between brain cells are what really make the brain work. And as the child grows and develops, the brain cells connect with each other in more complex ways. Different areas are responsible for different abilities, but they're all interconnected. They all contribute to the child's overall health and well-being. These early brain connections set the stage for higher level skills to develop later on, like motivation, focus, problem solving, and getting along with others. Things that really make a difference in a person's ability to learn and do well in school and in life. The first few years of life are the best opportunity to develop this network of brain connections. It's much harder later on. Connections that are used more often become stronger, while those that are not used are eventually eliminated, making the brain more efficient. Building brain connections is like building muscles. Use it or lose it. But these vital connections are not made automatically. They don't just happen. So how does healthy brain development happen? Through positive, stable, nurturing relationships with parents and caring adults. Study after study shows that caring interaction, stimulation, and love during their first few days weeks, months, and years help a child feel safe and secure and help their brain develop a strong, healthy network of connections. Unfortunately, the opposite is also true. Neuroscience shows the dramatic impact of persistent negative experiences and toxic stress. Fewer brain connections develop and at a slower rate. They also reinforce negative brain connections. Too many of Arizona's youngest kids face the kind of challenges that make it difficult for healthy brain development, like hunger and neglect. The evidence is clear. Positive, nurturing experiences in their early years help children feel safe and secure and go on to be healthier and more successful in school and in life. They tend to have better language, math, and social skills. They're more likely to graduate. They're more prepared for college and career and to be contributing members of their communities. And that's why Arizonans created First Things First, to partner with families and communities to support the health, development, and learning of our state's youngest children. First Things First supports programs focused on strengthening families, quality early education, 
and preventive health for children from birth to age five. Because we all share the responsibility of giving our children a good start in life. And we all benefit when kids arrive at kindergarten healthy and ready to succeed. Their success will be our success. So very nice video again. It says the success of the child is the success of the parents. Now, what we saw in the video is about the child's brain. You know, what is a very important new thing over here is the slide is resilience. It is the capacities innate in the brain and the body. It's hard, hardwired in by evolution and experience, both. So it's genetic, epigenetics, developmental, psychological, and neurochemical factors. It is encoded in the neural circuits, hormonal, and metabolic aspects of the body. So it's learned in response to the experiences and interactions and can be modified lifelong. So the prefrontal cortex works as a CEO of resilience. Okay. So these are new words for us, basically. So it's very important how the brain starts working. Okay. The child may be born immediately, but if the child doesn't require, uh, receive the right environment, the right talk to the mother, uh, the warm feeling that we talk about, here is the base. No, it says all these things work in the development of the brain. So just to show you a simple thing is a hardwired neuroscience. No? The synapses grow to an extent like 7,000 per second. The child is growing very, very, very fast, super fast, the jet speeds. So these wires, if they do not receive the right content, they die off, they wear off, okay? So how resilience is increased in the right initial period is the habits and the lifestyles, so the parents, maybe the child, the neural firing or the lack, you know, like thereof, epigenetics, inflammatory molecules have to be reduced, the hormonal and the neurochemical effects to be reduced. So the, it is like about the safety of the child, the diet which is given, the sleep, the exercises, the positive relationship that the child receives, the trust the child receives from the mother, the father, or the guardians here. The humor and the laughter, you know, these things can also increase the resilience. So the sense of control, you know, basically the child, no, it may be cranky. So how do we control over that? So these all things improve the resilience. Now, not only the resilience, the next what we see is in the development of the brain, what we all know as a neurophysiotherapist is the neuroplasticity. Okay. So it is the greatest discovery of the modern neuroscience growing new dendrites and neurons, you know, strengthening the synaptic connections, the myelinating pathways, the faster processing, creating an alternating brain structure and circulatory fire together, wire together. Okay. So organizing and reorganizing functions of the brain structures. The brain changes itself lifelong. So we are so happy to deal with such complicated part of human body, right? Nobody dares to touch this neuro section, but it is such a lovely thing that it can change one's lives and everybody's life if it is tackled in the right way, okay? So the big picture is everything is related, not only just one thing. The child may be born CP or autistic, if we work on the right things of the brain, how it works, then how it is, you know, the things can be increased. It's all related. 
that we see now. there is there is a solution every time okay so the factors affecting epigenetic modification of dna so i showed you a picture of the dna where the child is dependent on the dna of the parents okay so how we can modify over that it does make a difference over there so the factors affecting here are the relationships the environment in which it grows the developmental periods the environmental chemicals the drugs the diet exercise stress sleep attitude sense of control and sense inoculation now when i talk about stress inoculation uh, what is the stress in adults we talk about tension stress and other but what is that in children if the child doesn't receive a right relationship the right environment it gets into stress now what stress does is in this picture okay so it stress triggers the cortisol okay that means this secretion of cortisol now that happens in hypothalamus okay thereby the the signals are sent to the pituitary then by to the adrenal glands and therein there is a negative inhibition to the baby's brain to the, the brain okay so this definitely shows that if the child is not put into right track it may go into normal or abnormal depression retractions inward child you know the personality type so this is very very important from the chemical point of view which works in inside the body which is not at all seen so preparing this uh, seminar itself was like uh, doing phd over the brain okay so uh, this is in very very small picture that i have putting it in front of you all very new very nice next slide is the telomere story okay so as i'm working as a nutrition nutritionist from past 5 years uh, specific, specifically i'm working on the hereditary cases so as i said it is very important the health of the parents before they even plan for a child okay what we see here is the stress shortens the te telomeres okay the chromosomes the chromosomal abnormalities now as i said if the child is dealt right when the mother conceives even we can stop the hereditary cases okay so the chromosomes basically when you have it's in the x form the ends of all the chromosomes have something called as telomeres so the stress itself can have an direct impact over shortening of the chromosome so what we see here is stress decreases the activity of the telomeres an enzyme that protects telomeres which are protective tips of each of the four arms of the chromosomes now thereby the dna is created in the child maybe the mother is healthy the child is not healthy the child's dna can be you know stressed because of stress out it can be erased the telomeres can be erased and when it becomes big and it takes a child those telomeres of chromosomes are gone so that's how the hereditary uh, carry forwards are taken out okay so that there are as we go ahead we see how we can improvise over all these things so now this next picture which we see is the difference between the genetics and the infinite variability and combination that we can work nerves and pathways hormonal and neurotransmitter pathways so as i said if a child receives a danger area a fight or freeze a flight 
survival worse conditions it goes into negative things where the child receives a safety environment has a lot of people around it process possibilities of lot of things survives the best conditions vulnerable in the worst also the child learns the best so nowadays why the societal conditions are there may relate to our birth itself as you see when the child's brain receives all these negative impacts the resilience goes towards the negative impacts so the child may not have that environment in the mid you know like around 20s 30s but when the person grows the negative resilience is still there in the brain so once the person survives the worst conditions he can go into suicidal attempts or in the other way round the brain doesn't grow well the synaptic uh, neurons do not grow well the synapses doesn't grow well the connections and doesn't happen the adaptation doesn't happen okay so very next uh, slide is to explain you this in a small video Learning to deal with stress is an important part of healthy development. When experiencing stress, the stress response system is activated. The body and brain go on alert. There's an adrenaline rush, increased heart rate, and an increase in stress hormone levels. When the stress is relieved after a short time, or a young child receives support from caring adults, the stress response winds down and the body quickly returns to normal. In severe situations, is ongoing abuse and neglect where there is no caring adult to act as a buffer against the stress the stress response stays activated even when there is no apparent physical harm the extended absence of response from adults can activate the stress response system constant activation of the stress response overloads developing systems with serious lifelong consequences for the child this is known as toxic stress Over time this results in a stress response system set permanently on high alert. In the areas of the brain dedicated to learning and reasoning, the neural connections that comprise brain architecture are weaker and fewer in number. Science shows that the prolonged activation of stress hormones in early childhood can actually reduce neural connections in these important areas of the brain at just the time when they should be growing new ones. Toxic stress can be avoided if we ensure that the environments in which children grow and develop are nurturing, stable, and engaging. So so the next part uh, comes the importance of nutrition over here before we enter the what's the exact nutrition that we need for the child let's do the basics again okay so here is a small picture which says uh, shows the brain and the brain cells as we all know the cells of the body you know has a membrane which is a semi permeable the brain also has cells which has you know semi permeable membrane but when we go to the most inner level brain cells are highly resistant to any nutrition parts that we see okay that means we are seeing over here, here the capillary in general and the capillaries in the brain the cells in the brain they do, do not allow 
anything to enter into the cell. It's very, very protective. Okay, that's how the brain works. So what we say is it's very, uh, the glucose itself can enter into the cells. Okay, that we are saying the oxygen, the glucose, and the very, very important nutrients into the cells again. So to know whatever nutrition that we give to the child, it goes to the body, okay, not to the brain. So for example, if we give 100% food, okay, just 20 to 25 percent the body absorbs and converts it into nutrition the brain is still much less into it okay as because the nutrition is absorption so the semi permeable membrane of the cells is very 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 smooth you know minute so here just let me brush into another few areas where the cell and the free radicals are very important. Now, when the child is born, it's very bubbly. Because it all has, it has. Now, as a child grow, starts growing, you know, that we have that balance trait which we have seen. So, the healthy cells are growing at a faster rate. The dying every day we have dying cells. Now, why these cells die is because of these free radicals which are there. It may be within the body by its own inflammatory process or by external things like many other oxidative stress that we see next. So the cell is attacked by the free radicals and thereby oxidative stress or destruction of the cells are seen. So these free radicals are like robbers, which are deficient in energy. So they attack and snatch an electron from the other cells to satisfy themselves and thus damage the cell membranes. So thereby the cells start dying. The lot of affections are seen, the sunlight exposure, the atmosphere, the stress, the poor diet that we are seeing, all affect the cells. Okay, so we can see a cell on one side which is healthy and because of uh, uh, free radicals, the cell starts dying or damaging. Okay, so very uh, simple thing uh, next year is what is the difference between that healthy thing, uh, we, we are healthy and we are unhealthy is a big process. Okay, so that is called as health to pathology. So what we should know in between is, it is just because the cell dysfunction, all the things are rising across. It may be from the child or to the adults. But because of this oxidative stress, okay, which can be structural or regulatory, okay, wherein, as we say, a fixed or reversible. Okay. So their dysfunction starts. When we tackle the body right in the initial period, that is what I'm telling is early detection, we can go reversible. Now when the oxidative damage happens to the fuller extent, which is irreversible, the cell is dead. Okay, when we talk about the basics of life, we cannot pull the cell up. Okay, we cannot thereby build in too much of improvements in the baby or the adults. Okay, so very important thing, when the basic homeostasis happens, we intervene, we talk to the baby's body in terms of nutrition, in terms of exercise. We have seen as a child goes into too much of activity, the cells growth happen too much. If the child is not moving or it is like a floppy child, there is no cell activity being happening, thereby not only neurons are wearing off, but the cells are also wearing off. Okay, so it's, it's very important at that right time. Okay. So the causes of oxidative stress may be from within or from outside, maybe by the parent or, you know, by the child itself which can be experienced. So I'll just list them here. 
it can be diet it can be medications and treatments it can be different air water quality environment to another the stress lack of good nutrition okay inadequate amounts of physical activity by the child itself the pesticides exposure to the toxins inadequate intake of fruits and vegetables and even excess of exercise can give you oxidative stress okay so nutrition when we study we have a huge list what to take what not to take okay but here is a small picture which gives a very uh, important parts of uh, nutrition vitamin c vitamin a vitamin you know e iron zinc okay dha specifically this is a brain development one so these are key nutrients for the child looks attractive so hope all mothers are ready to prepare them at home and keep them ready okay so basically the role of antioxidants here that means oxidation that is happening in the body as i showed you all the role of antioxidants becomes very important so wondering if the vitamins for cerebral palsy can help reduce some of these symptoms many people with cp have some sort of feeding problem so it's very difficult for them to receive all their essential nutrients but taking supplements may be helpful for individuals with cp because they do not require chewing so what's the best vitamin for cerebral palsy let's find out okay so deciding upon the nutrition that is in home or from the market okay i have also shown one important glutathione you know which is which is very important for the brain growth right from the day one of the child okay so best vitamins as we list omega 3 calcium and vitamin d magnesium vitamin c zinc probiotics and vitamin b12 okay there is a list of uh, related antioxidants for uh, autism coenzyme q10 okay so there is aha which is a part of uh, uh, dha glutathione as i said mito q which which uh, uh, activates the mitochondria and etc many studies are being done they are done all the nutrition but are we happy do we get all these vitamins in our food so how many pills are you going to give a child how many medicines are you going to give a child rather than so vitamins for cerebral palsy or autism they should not replace a healthy diet now because your own overall health is largely dependent on the health of your cells it is aptly said you have to fix the cell to get well cells are the foundation of the health for example sick and toxic cells equal a sick congested inflamed body thus you have to fix the cell allow the good things to penetrate and the bad things that the toxins to escape to get well and grow bigger okay so the best vitamins again the best cerebral palsy diet as noted in a paper given here is one that's going to promote optimal brain function and combat weakness caused by the secondary or the associated conditions the source of motor impairment in individuals with the cerebral palsy is not a problem with the body but rather a problem with the brain in this article you now um, some of the best foods to add into cerebral palsy diet to maximum the health the child's brain or the body that they state down i have already presented so that is a cerebral palsy diet so the children with cerebral palsy can experience a lot of different conditions 
conditions like spasticity or difficulties feeding difficulties and digestion problems okay so we do not see uh, too much of nutrition getting into these children because the mother herself or the parents are confused that the child is not eating anything but rather if we really tell them the nutrition the right nutrition the right food required and is right there in their home and tell them what to eat and what not to eat the child's brain can start getting better now the nutrition can also add into a better sleep patterns so the child eats well sleeps well okay so the take home message here from the nutrition part is now that you have the food part down let's go over some other things to keep in mind if a child has the difficulties chewing and swallowing consider blending their food so that it's easier to consume some children with cerebral palsy have gastrointestinal reflux disease which can cause stomach acid to irritate the esophagus and the and then cause heartburn so greasy spicy acidic foods can trigger acidic reflux and they should be avoided so when it comes to child's diet quantity and quality are both equal and they are important you have to ensure that the food going into the child's body is nutritious and will contribute to their growth and their well being so that's a wrap up the best foods to add to a cerebral palsy or the autism kid are full of vitamins and minerals that will help empower the brain and keep the body strong so there is a hypothetical scenario here in which the child's experience acts as a mediator between nutritional status and the motor cognitive and social emotional development okay so what we see here is with the nutritional status physical growth physical activity the care and interactions the brain development and the function the level of the child's interaction with the environment all work together are interconnected so until now what we see is the topics covered cp autism you know in in brief so our role the prenatal development of the brain the baby brain the new concept what we have learned today is resilience the epigenetics the neuroplasticity the toxic stress nutrition okay so here i'll be presenting you all a classical cases which now we are running a fitness first since past 10 years as a treatment center and uh, lalit academy and research center is working to study for the detection and the rehabilitation center for such children now very classical cases i'll be going on this is a very small child which had come to me around 5 uh, months okay just during the treatment section now these photos have been sent by their parents on whatsapp okay so the child is happy doing the prayers helping the mother in the kitchen and you know, playing around with the kids peer uh, groups and is also independent classic case 2 the child was uh, with me around 6 to 8 months with the torticollis Uh, child had little, uh, which was a mild kind. And today stands to be the best in the school, the best dancer, athletics, and everything. Yeah. The classic case, the very important here is I dealt with this case of microcephaly, where the brain is just very very small, like a monkey, and the brain growth doesn't happen. now within just two months of exercise physical the and nutritional the child comes to almost normal this is a two year old child and when the child was around uh, one year we had handled this case with a continuous treatment um, it almost comes to normal with its body growth as well and the circumference we are seeing has almost reached normal to its face right so we can handle and improve microcephaly cases 
ठीक है very classical case again as we all come across so this is just a 14 day old baby with herbs palsy now herbs palsy is detected immediately the day one where the child doesn't move because this happens during birth okay so this improved very well now the second child which was here with me at the age of 3 months with just four sittings we could get the hand moving now this child had already because it was 3 months that it already uh, got into a certain deformity you know uh, the elbow was little tight the tone was increased um, the shoulder was difficult to raise about one inch. that was passive active was impossible so with just four sittings along with exercises let me look but mm -hmm. okay the just the exercise and nutrition okay we could get it in four sittings now these are the very classical cases i have put it together which have got a near normal life so many child like we we have seen over 500 children now uh, they have got few very few are here okay the child at the age of 16 we could get them to normal studies cognition Uh, relations um, and school peer work up and studies everything we can see the second photo where the uh, see this is a spastic child who couldn't stand you know he says namaste you know, this was all sent by uh, whatsapp we are seeing the other girl child where uh, it is with the parent everywhere they go when the child was with me it couldn't even crawl sit understand who are his, her parents or anything today they are together still as because the brain neuroplasticity is growing the child is improving day by day the fourth picture which we are seeing the child gets almost normal and it is uh, into the normal environment uh, which mingles in the family many more to present in front of you all you know the child here in the red uh, photo was uh, rejected saying that it will not grow at all you have to be with this child your life long until it is alive but today we have the child walking and uh, you know you can see the smile being as normal as normal, you know the other normal children i basically the uh, vision of the child was like kabhi nahi aayega it will never come back but we did work over the visual aspect as well and today it can recognize parents and you know, friends and you know, communication has been started where it couldn't speak initially okay the other picture which has lot of pictures onto it i've uh, been like huge number of children which we are ha um, handling from all the aspects ortho neuro chest okay and helping them improve and be independent now from the lalit academy and the research center we have been organizing lot of functions free camps creative programs for the children and the wards okay so we have uh, orientation plans and recognitions we have another over here where we have food for all where parents get together so it's a potluck you know what we call so we have the get together and all the parents uh, get to talk to each other you know so and feel that my child is not alone but like my child there are other children as well so i have to work with my children as well so celebrations of every child is being done with lots of fun so i'm very happy to present this today and thanks uh, to the whole exrx team to give me an opportunity to share this and also spread the awareness that if the child is brought to a physiotherapist or the pediatric physiotherapist you know at the early age we can get them to normal life okay so as a tagline goes prevention is better than cure the above statement looks true when you can foresee the possible physical problems and then prevent them from happening 
but does it apply here it doesn't when many words come after encountering issues okay so 90% problems are encountered already that is child is presented to us with many many additive conditions rather than just one single condition hence it becomes very important to detect early and intervene early and have a early recovery for example the child presenting to us after 5 years imagine this video shown to you all it's already grown okay it would also include psychological sociological issues rather than just one condition which will contribute for their slower recovery now here also when the child grows after 5 years the environment at the home the parents all have a set mindset when the child is just like this so if it doesn't grow so it's okay the parents are very inquisitive they do approach you know and they have that uh, the child has to get to normal attitude so without saying it goes that we need to conduct many health awareness programs educate people about early detection soon after the birth and how it can be avoided to the max by very simple measures so role of every physiotherapist become is the recovery is our main focus and not maintenance okay so we as physiotherapists we have a very specialized knowledge about development so we understand how disabilities affect lives we know very well we are not just about helping recover from the physical disability but we listen and agree a plan of treatment with the wards we also help to improve the flexibility and prevent deformities over here okay so what the treatment objectives become important to us here so we improve the child's ability to cope up with the environment the general sense of understanding increase level of activity return to the normal milestones and development and we can decrease the healthcare utilization and thereby eliminate or reduce on medical usage okay so take away home from this topic today get the child as early as 3 months for just uh, example like it doesn't have a head holding okay before 1 year neuroplasticity is at at its max so you can do wonders with it okay as because the fixed deformities corrections would be very difficult so return to the normal milestones or development okay and then so decreased healthcare utilization is there an elimination of reduction of medical usage so with the multidisciplinary approach we can achieve the best okay so with this i thank you all for your patient listening and um, hope i've conveyed the best to you all and to the public as well the awareness of increasing alarmingly increase increasing um, ratio of these children can be brought down thank you thank you ma'am so it was very nice presentation and it was catchy with your slides also ma'am it was interesting overall so yeah chandramohan sir yes yes rupesh am i audible yes sir yes sir yeah thank you thank you so much abhijit lakshmi ma'am uh, the not only slides it was a virtual treat and the way you take uh, the uh, session is like not only for the physiotherapist every medicos should uh, learn this and not only the medicos even for the public it will be useful and in case if you have opportunities to do it in our local area with our local language please do it to educate the public now i thank all my physio i mean uh, my uh, pediatric uh, doctors over here who are referring me at the early age itself so 
all of them in my local uh, area you know, yes. i thank them and you said the number 500 500 means it's really huge it's not easy i know how much so when i started work. handling with nutrition it started giving very nice and faster uh, results so that's how we started into statistics also so mm-hmm. in future may you know in a present papers or even give a good uh, report to the publics so we can do a difference to the society thank you thank you so much madam we will move on to question and answer session dear participants uh, if you have any doubts please uh, write down in the chat box or you can unmute and uh, raise your hand we will unmute you so that you can ask our resource person uh, 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 youtube viewers you can write your doubts in the chat box live chat box we will read your question here please check madam uh, duna madam uh, rupesh yes, please sir, check yeah. with you no questions yet sir in youtube okay here also no questions we will conclude the session and uh, i tried I my best to put it in just and uh, you know work it out clearly because it's very important when you are handling children because they cannot speak and uh, it's just the cry that we have to understand thank you madam thank you so thank much you, for a thank wonderful so session thank you so much for giving me uh, this platform sir yeah you are always welcome and uh, i thank exrx india team members dr rupesh and professor duna and ms simran and uma and alisha so everyone uh, who is present here and bairo all are present here thank you all and uh, this is chandra mohan bye bye thank See you all have a nice day yeah have a nice day bye bye thank you ma'am thank you